Well, thank you, Giovanni, and good morning, everyone. So when I was first asked to do this talk, I thought, my first thoughts were terror. I thought, all these people in the room that know about creativity, and I don't. And then I thought, hang on a minute. The Marconi Society is full of the world's most creative people in telecoms. And here, for example, we have Bob Kahn, we have Vince Cerf, just fresh from two of the five winners of the Queen Elizabeth Prize, which is for creativity. We have people like Federico Fagin, the designer of the first microprocessor. We have Irvi Kogelnik, Andy Kraplevy, Bob Kosh. These are just incredibly creative people. And I thought, why should I be terrified? So what I've done is um, I've fled uh, to my comfort zone. And I'm going to tell you about how the internet was created through the optical fiber network which spans the world. How did that come about? Introduce you to some of my creative heroes and try to give you some idea of uh, what the future might bring. So I fill this up with hopefully fun videos because creativity is about fun. You know, we, we are people whose careers are about having fun. Uniquely, we combine our work with our play. That's what creative people do. So let's, um, let's have a, a walk through. Now this is a fiber laser that nobody would ever have imagined um, would result from the internet. And I'm gonna show you how that came about. But let me introduce you to some of my heroes. So I've dedicated this talk to, of course, Guillermo Marconi, the invention of wireless. The laser, Charles Towns, and another Charles, Charles Cow, who were Nobel laureates in physics in those respective years, 1909, uh, 1964, and 2009. Creative people, if I've ever seen them. And I used to know Charlie very well. So these are my heroes, and we'll be introducing you to some other creative heroes throughout this talk. The first point I would like to make, and it's really the only point where I venture into your area of expertise, which is that it occurred to me that creativity is a linear process. Those that are involved in it will know that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And very few inventions can ever have just popped out of nowhere. We build on enormous quantities of work elsewhere. But until it is disrupted. And that's what truly creative people do. We disrupt the world. We enjoy disrupting the world. And there are many stories which you will hear about how you were nearly killed for what you did by your peers because they feel threatened by it. <laughs> and that happened to me too. 450 people sat in a room and told me I was wrong. <laughs> and um, that's part of the creative process. So, this is the way I saw it um, for the optical telecommunications. This is, those of you that don't know, the heavy lifting on the internet today is done by optical fibers. I mean, that's an incredible thought. These thin strands of glass which carry huge quantities of data worldwide. 95% of the internet data is carried by optical fibers and the wireless is the final drop which is why, of course, I have celebrated wireless and Charles Cowell for the optical fiber. So those are um, the laser, the fiber, the amplifier, and WDM I'm going to introduce you to. It stands for Wavelength Division Multiplexing. And we have, again, people in this room who brought that very important uh, innovation to bear. And that, in fact, created and this is another thing about creativity and disruption. It created the world's biggest boom and bust because people, business models couldn't handle it. So let us start then at the beginning. The Telegraph, and I thought you'd be interested in, in reading this. This is from 
um, the message that Queen Victoria sent to President Buchanan um, in uh, 1858. And I wanted you to, to ask you whether you think this is true of today's internet. May the Atlantic Telegraph prove to be a bond of perpetual peace and friendship between the kindred nations and an instrument destined by divine providence to diffuse religion, civilization, liberty, and law throughout the world. Do you think it does that? <laughs> it does some of that, but there's some bad lands out there as well, but that's another talk. So we move on from there, and the other thing to notice about this is it was 4,200 um, and it was one bit per second, one pulse per second, because of course it was Morse code. So this is the first example of the optical internet, only it wasn't very good. But if we try to think about why optical, well it turns out, and I did my research, and I discovered that I wasn't the first person to think of this. In fact, Ischilos in 4588 BC wrote the following, and this is actually true. This was, was written, these are the actual words. What he was writing about was the fall of Troy. So he was writing um, his wife, Clytemnestra, who looks a pretty formidable lady, I have to say. And this is what's actually written in the play. What time of day was it when Troy, when Troy was destroyed? Clytemnestra, not day, but night. Last night, in fact. So how did she know? And the news has arrived already. How could that happen? At the speed of light. The sacred fire blazed from beacon tower to beacon tower, from Ida's top to Lemnos. Well, read it for yourself. So what I did was I tracked what they did. They lit beacons all the way within viewing distance. And here is the, um, is the track which we followed through. And you see that this was the first example of a repeated communication system. And it's a huge distance. So here are the numbers for you. It's the first free space optical link transmission over 6,000 kilometers. And forget this is 458 BC. The longest span was 150 kilometers and it was one bit per night. <laughs> so we are actually making progress when you think about it. And we also did some calculation and it required a five to 10 meter high wood pile fire of tens of megawatts of uh, dissipation. Today you will know perhaps that the internet is chewing up two to three percent of the world's power. But it wasn't as bad as that. Too bad if it rained. <laughs> Fortunately, it doesn't at that time of year in Greece. So there you go. We didn't have the light source. That was the problem. And of course, actually you can go back through, um, through history and you can find many examples of the use of optics. Here's the uh, famous Red Indians. Um, light and smoke emission regulation system, or laser for short, and wait for the laser system uh, to come about. And uh, of course, this was improved upon by the eye smoke 5S, clearer signals with a smaller blanket and longer lasting fire. But it took, uh, it took many centuries before uh, we get to modern optical communications. Now this was anticipated again by a, a set of amazingly creative people who could see f with a vision and a clarity which few people lack. Sorry, few, few people have. And they realized, at the, and this is an actual patent that I will show you, um, by Art Charlot and Towns et al, Mazers and Maser Communication Systems. This was taken before the invention of the laser. And you see that this is the diagram here, <coughs> here is, and this is what they said. 
a communication system for operation in the infrared visible or ultraviolet regions of the electromagnetic wave spectrum, comprising a monochromatic maser generator. They didn't even have a laser then. So these were people that anticipated, way back in 1958, what took another 30 to 40 years to arrive. And of course, the thing that was missing from that was the transmission channel. As we've seen, if you use free space, it rains, you have a problem. You also, the, the light signal spreads. So it was pretty clear that the transmission channel was the thing that was missing. But once again, this had been anticipated by Claude Schapp. And perhaps you, you may know this, but Europe was surrounded by these towers. This was a form of communications used in the 19th century by a form of semaphore, as you see here. The French had developed a form of semaphore from the top of these towers. And so this was, it was visible communications, optical communications. And of course, we have an Italian contribution here, Gutierrez's atmospheric telegraph. The idea here was you pumped it up and you used pulses of, of air. Uh, this one didn't survive very long, I have to say. Of course, Bell himself, before um, inventing the telephone, had anticipated the use of what he called the photophone. But again, it was all free space. And then comes along this disruptive person, the genius of Charles Cow, who realized that the transmission spectrum here of glass, in particular silica, would permit huge distance to be traversed by light. Um, what I've plotted there is a rather unusual way of looking at things, which is the thickness of a piece of glass um, that would have a loss of 30 dBs. That's a thousand times. And a thousand times is about what you can tolerate um, between a transmitter and a receiver. And it turns out that nature has been unbelievably kind to us. And this is another theme. Creative people recognize the contributions of nature and they build on it. So Charles Cowell came along and wrote in his classics 1966 um, paper, a fiber of glassy material represents a possible practical optical waveguide with important potential as a new form of communication medium. You need to put yourself into the context of when he wrote that. It seems obvious now, but at the time, absolutely extraordinary prescient. And most people once again said, you're crazy. Because the loss of a, of a simple window glass is about 30%. And here's Charlie saying, actually, you could have a window a 1,000 kilometers thick, and we'd still get through it. So sure enough, everybody thought he was nuts. However, and here's an interesting <laughs> You don't often see a press release with a 10 to the fourfold underestimate because this was put out by Charles's company, STL, and I want you to look at a couple of things that I've, I've marked here. Referring to uh, optical fibers, they have exhibited an information carrying capacity of one gigacycle. Well, you can tell this is a press release because that should be gigacycle per second, but there you go. It is capable of carrying 10 milliwatts of power. I'm going to come back to that. And finally, the best readily available low-loss material has a loss of about 1,000 dBs per kilometer, which is you know, completely impractical. But they put out a press release on it. Well, the rest comes as history. So once again, we go back to 3000 BC. And we see, we're plotting vertically here, the losses in dBs per kilometer. 10 to the 7 means you can hardly see through it. Egyptian times, Venetian times, technology is improving. Until a great period of innovation in Germany, Jena, Carl Zeiss, uh, for example, Otto Schott, who perfected optical glasses for cameras, for optical instruments. And you see here, um, that it had kind of bottomed out at 1 dB per meter, roughly, 1,000 dB per kilometer. So I came along here. Um, as you can see, a lot of fiber growth there. And 
It would be uh, invidious to suggest that I was the only person that uh, contributed to what happened following that. But um, there, were, there were huge contributions from all over the world, most notably Cor uh, Bell Labs, um, Corning Glass Works, ourselves. Um, and within a matter of a year or two, those losses had come down to what they are today, um, which is a, few, a fraction of a dB per kilometer. This meant that you could now do 100 kilometers before the light dims too much. And this just created an explosion of interest throughout the world. Companies were created, people started stringing fibers all over the place, and you see there um, the history from Jeff Heft, City of Light, which I would encourage you to read. But there was just one further problem that we needed, it was fine, 100 kilometers, but people got greedy because that's what happens with creativity. You open one door and people roar through it, but then there's another that shut to you. And this was clearly the fact that what we needed was some way of amplifying the light. And you see here the status, this is a cartoon that was actually produced at the time. Um, you see the incoming light sources here. It'll come, yep. Incoming light source here, a detector man, um, a brain which of course is used uh, to uh, demodulate the signal and then he passes it to the new transmitter. Thank you. Um, and we have a light source, which is shown as a light bulb here, and then we retransmit it. So this is obviously not the greatest and most effective way of doing these things. So what we needed to do was to come up with an optical amplifier. And this is what we did. Southampton University's Optoelectronics Research Center played a pivotal role in the development of optical fibers that underpin the internet. Even then, the ORC had an enviable reputation for producing low-loss fiber capable of carrying signals across great distances. We thought, well, there is a problem here. Optical telecommunications works very well but only for about 100 kilometers, even with the very best fibers that we had made. The light just dimmed. And what did you do? Because that wasn't far enough to get across an ocean. So we turned our thoughts to how we might change that. Now, we were part of a laser group here as well. So you had fibers and lasers together in one group. And we thought, why not combine them? Why don't we make a laser or an amplifier in a fiber itself. So, we thought of this idea and we put erbium into the core of the fiber, pumped it with a little laser diode, same as you have in your DVD player, and bingo. In 1987, we announced to an amazed world that we've made an amplifier in the fiber itself. At the time, in 1987, this was viewed as Blue Sky's research. It changed the world when it came to telecommunications, and here it is changing the world again in industrial processing, manufacturing, cutting, welding, making holes in jet engines, an amazing variety of different manufacturing techniques. So I'm sorry that's a little quiet, but I think you get the idea so now we had an erbium-doped fiber amplifier, which was an amplifier within the fiber itself. So I thought I'd analyze a little bit um, the nature of this particular creative moment in the development of the internet. And I have to say, one of the aspects of creativity is you rarely understand the true impact of what you've just done. And you always, as I said in my introduction yesterday, underestimate what that impact will be. So this is what we wrote. The broad fluorescence life line width of rare earth ions in glass allows the construction of broadband amplifiers for use in wavelength division multiplexing. This was before anybody had done wavelength division multiplexing. That was in 1985. 
We then produced 24 publications on lasers before we figured out that it might be a good idea to take the, the mirrors off. <laughs> because we were laser people. So another aspect of creativity is you sit in your box. This point has been made. And even a simple thing like taking off mirrors, which are required in a laser, we didn't think of for another two years. And then we produced this publication in 1987. But the other interesting thing was we also said in 1986, as a power amplifier, the fiber device could have advantages over the bulk glass systems of lasers. We're back to lasers now. Remember, we're laser guys. By reducing the problems of thermal distortion and thermal fracture. I'm going to come back to that statement. But remember Charles Cow's press release, which said 10 milliwatts is all you can get through. So a great deal of prescience there. So now we go back to Isaac Newton. You can't give a talk on creativity without mentioning Isaac Newton, right? So this is his famous sketch. The first thing you notice about him, he's a pretty untidy sort of guy. And he was the first to note that light was made up of different colors. So with that earlier work, we came up with wavelength division multiplexing, the community for which uh, Andy Kreplevy, Bob Cash are extremely well known, more Marconi fellows. And the idea here is very simple, which is that you have multiple colors down here. And you combine these together and you put them down an amplified link like this. And each one of those colors is capable of carrying enormous bandwidth capacity. So they're up to, in many cases, thousands of different colors. And this was the great innovation that caused the explosion um, in, in the great boom and bust times. So let me show you what one actually looks like. So the other thing about creativity I always think of is the extraordinary arrogance of people who create things. You imagine a set of engineers that said, oh, no problem, what we'll do is we will string across the world 100 million kilometers of this fiber and we will create the internet. And there they are, those arrogant people doing exactly that. And I'm re reminded of the fact that Muhammad Ali once said, it's not arrogance if you can prove it. And there they are proving it. That's an optical amplifier going into the sea. So enough deployed optical fiber today to encircle the Earth 23,000 times. Bridging the digital divide, where are we today? If you add wireless and optical communications around Africa, for example, you see 1.4 billion optical internet users and 3.3 billion cell phone users. It has changed the world. So the phases of the optical internet, the laser, the optical fiber, the low-loss silica, Kekmara and Schultz uh, from Corning, De Severe Giles, Payne for the uh, optical amplifier, uh, WDM followed after that, to where we are today, 100 million kilometers, 50 terahertz per fiber, enough for 25 million broadband channels in one fiber. That is the most extraordinary achievement. But there's a problem. So another aspect, I think, of creativity is that as I've said earlier, you open a door and people rush through it and then they want more and they learn to use it. And sooner or later, because you have created this medium that you can be profligate with, it gets used up, which leads you to the next great point of innovation. So that's exactly what's happening today. Video is eating up the bandwidth. And here's some numbers for you. That's showing the growth in uh, the internet traffic. Every passing month, more video footage is uploaded to the web than all three big US networks.
have broadcast in the last 60 years. The gigabyte equivalent of all movies ever made will cross the global IP networks every three minutes. What are you guys watching? <laughs> Video exceeded half of global consumer internet traffic in December 2011. That is incredible. So we're running out of capacity in the individual fibers. What does this mean? It means a massive change in the business models that we will need in the future because you're going to have to put in huge amounts of fiber, um, much more than you have at the moment. We've been through a phase where we're simply eating up the installed bandwidth. Which comes us back to those Greeks. Maybe they were right. Air is the right choice. But you have to now use confined air. And you see here another of um, the inventions that came from Southampton, which is uh, what is called a photonic band gap fiber. It's got a hole in the middle. The problem, of course, is that the hole in the middle doesn't guide the light, and unless you have this very, very fancy structure on the outside, and those are fibers actually the size of your hair. So look at those structures. They're just amazing that we have learned to make. And we're not there yet, but using the air will reduce the losses enormously and also reduce a problem which we have, which is what's called non-linearity. The more power you put in a fiber, it won't come to as a surprise to you to know that it blows up eventually. <laughs> so, can we be even more creative with fibers? And I wanted to get to the end of my talk by noting and introducing some, some new um, creative people to you. In particular, Theodore Maiman, who produced the first working laser in 1960. Eli Snitzer, who sadly passed away um, earlier in this year, produced the first fiber laser in 1964 by wrapping a fiber doped with neodymium around a flash lamp. Charles Cow, that I've introduced you to already. And these guys, the fiber amplifier. And this led us to examine that press release which said 10 milliwatts. And we said, hang on a minute, do we really believe that or could we put the internet in a box? Shown here, a small seed laser, multiple amplifiers, just as we have on the internet, but now building the power higher and higher and higher until we have an output. And there's what one of those fibers looks like. And the, the world record today is 14 kilowatts out of one tiny fiber. So what does that lead us to? Oops. A whole new area of marketing. Welding cars together. That's a four kilowatt fiber laser. And this is a real-time cutting of holes. Applications such as marking fruit to get rid of the sticky labels, micro-machining, making stents. 80% of the world's stents are now made with fiber lasers. So a revolution in processing. But here's another thing about creativity. It's often anticipated. Now look at that cut. See how jagged it is? It was faked. That won't surprise you. But we can do that today. And I'll show you in a minute what it really looks like. What I think they did to get that is they cut from underneath by hand with the oxyacetylene torch. You know nothing, Mr. Bond. Operation Grand Slam, for instance. So this is what it really looks like. That's 
one and a half inch thick steel. You see how square and straight it is? So even more creative then, what happens if we now take these laser circuits? Because remember, this is just fiber stuff, so it's relatively easy to combine them all together using internet technology and think forward. Particle acceleration using laser wake field. I haven't got time to explain what that is. That's creation of the world's most powerful laser by combining up to a million fiber lasers together. Nuclear fuel transmutation using fast particles which can decay the nasty things in nuclear fuel so that the lifetime drops from 100,000 years to just a few days. That would be massively um, disruptive. Tabletop synchrotrons instead of kilometer sizes. So I wanted you to see this. So I can search for what lies beyond the Higgs boson begins. The most powerful laser ever conceived is switched on. This scenario belongs in the future, yet the research required to try and make it happen has already started. But exactly what is I can? You know, existing huge laser experiments fire sometimes only four times a day. We're now talking about the possibility that you could do this with an average power so that it's on all the time. The reason this is possible is because of the unique way the laser is conceived. What happens is you start with a single seed laser and then you split that into eight different channels amplify, split those channels into eight, and then split those channels into eight until you get up to, say, 512 amplifiers. And then those 512 amplifiers, the beams have to be synchronized and brought together to make a single beam. So let me finish with that piece of megalomania. What I've learned about creativity after 45 years in photonics now, this is a characteristic of all of us. <laughs> the older I get, the better I was. How to be successful. And this is taken from what I actually uh, teach my, my students. Succeed in spite of management. <laughs> Creative people are mavericks. Organizations have to learn how to accommodate them, and that's not easy in big organizations. Rome did not create a great empire by having meetings. They did it by killing all those who opposed them. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, destroy all evidence that you tried. And empower young minds before they become polluted. The law of the initial maximum. Try first, try often, learn from your mistakes. And it's surprising how few young people know that these days. Successful experiment is worth a thousand theories. You can always make your lucky breaks look calculated afterwards. And PowerPoint does not create things. <laughs> Never be afraid to be wrong or to admit it when you are. The only mistakes to be ashamed of are those where you should have known better. Revisit your apparent Failures, and this is a very important point, successful inventions require the right timing. 
People are everything. Be bold, recruit the best. You cannot make the world different if surrounded by indifferent people. Always work with people smarter than you. And I've managed that very effectively, I have to say. Take calculated risks. The key word there is calculated. <laughs> and finally, be lucky in your friends. So I introduce you once again to those purple persons that you saw right at the very beginning. Here's Charles Cowell. This is my wife, Vanessa, that many would have met. She's here. And this is the only time that the two Charlies ever met, Charles Towns, Charles Cow, and this is Kathleen Maiman, uh, who represents Ted Maiman, who sadly passed away. And this is Cindy de Sevier, the wife of Emmanuel de Sevier, and the only reason I show her rather than him is she's prettier. So thank you for listening. Thank you, David, for a fascinating speech. It is fascinating when creativity meets science and physics, and they all come together to bring real uh, impact on the world. Any questions from you, please? David, thank you for that wonderful talk. It's, uh, it's always inspiring to hear somebody breach uh, the millennia, so to speak, uh, in in, in imparting wisdom. I, I have two questions. Uh, one may be irrelevant, and I'm happy to have you tell me that, but one I was wondering why those fiber amplifiers that went into the ocean were so large, they looked the size of torpedoes. And number two, uh, I once heard Bob Lucky give a talk about solitons. Do they have any role to play here? Because he was explaining how they could improve communications. So let me take those in sequence. Um, thank you for the questions. The size of that repeater is largely because of the huge pressure that it has to take. So it's a great big steel canister. So a lot of mechanical engineering goes into it. Optical amplifiers today can be the size of a cigarette packet. Um, that's but not for deep ocean use. To go back to the soliton question, yes, there, was, uh, there were not many dead ends in the development um, of the internet, and that was one of them. Although it must be said that quasi-solitonic communications is, is sometimes used, where you use a little bit of the nonlinearity, and there are more expert people in the, in the audience uh, than, than I am on that. But the, the concept of solitons, which is to go fully nonlinear, um, never made it because it just proved to be, from an engineering perspective, far too difficult. They collided with each other, they interacted with each other. These are a special kind of pulse, folks. I'm sorry, this is a little bit geeky here, but uh, these are special kinds of pulses which are highly nonlinear and balance nonlinearity with dispersion as they propagate. Very special forms they found in nature. Um, the famous um, tidal bores, for example, are solitons. Um, so they're found in nature, but uh, they didn't make it, um, I'm afraid, in optical telecoms. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> Is that a challenge for future generations, or have you written the last word on that? I never say never. Um, <laughs> my personal view... Um, is there an interesting scientific curiosity? Um, they will be unlikely to be deployed um, as fully solitonic systems because actually they're lower bandwidth than doing it linearly. But there are aspects and there are uses of solitons in devices which uh, people are exploring uh, for nonlinear switching, for example. Okay, David, we would listen to you all day, but we have to move on. So thanks again. Thank you very much.